Welcome back, everyone, to Citywide Blackout, your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. Well, for this one, folks, it's a dual comic episode. First up, I'm chatting with four-time Eisner-nominated writer, designer, and publisher Christopher Sabella to talk about his new series, Dot Self, which you can only find on Comixology Originals. We talk all about the role of his main character, Natalie Winters, the perception of a perfect life, and why she's so determined to get it back. Chris also talks about the character building process and the different personalities he's created in the many titles he's worked on. And joining me now, well, folks, we are talking about the recently released Comixology original series, Dot Self. It is a mind-bending sci-fi thriller. And right now I'm talking with a four-time Eisner-nominated writer, designer, and publisher. He is the co-creator of titles like Crowded, Dead Dudes, Welcome Back, and Dead Letters. Chris Abella joins me. Chris, welcome to the show, man. I am so psyched that we get to talk about this because I am loving the comic. Sweet. Thanks for having me. No problem, man. No problem. So uh, this question probably uh, um, uh, got in a bunch, but I am curious as to how you uh, kind of built the world or the science for Dot Self because this is such like cutting edge or like bleeding edge stuff. Um, yeah, I, I try to just make – I try to make the logic of stuff make sense to me. And if that works, then I hope that it will work for everybody else. I tend to uh, be one of those dudes who's always – annoyingly calling out uh you know fiction for like well this doesn't make logical sense in the real world um and it really robs me of a lot of enjoyment of things but uh for some reason in my work it's i i love solving the problem of like how do i make this make sense um so it's a lot of bs uh mixed with research to where it all sounds kind of truthy Mm-hmm. And uh, as long as it passes that smell test, then I feel good about it. Sounds good. So let's dive into the science then, because I was really intrigued by this. So, so the world of dot self is one in which you basically make a copy not only of things like your social media activity, like your web history, but yourself, your memories, your feelings, your physical reactions. Postscript, which is like the tech, copies you every day. And it's for, it's for like like a lot of uh, different reasons, among them being so that if you die, your family can basically have that closure by seeing you one more time because this backup of you can get put into a blank artificial body. Damn, dude. Well, how long did you spend kind of like crafting all this? Um, Not super long. Mm-hmm. Like once I came up with the general idea, which was like, what if you had a backup file of yourself and it got leaked onto Pirate Bay? Mm-hmm. Like that was... I then I just had to sort of work from there and you know I think I figured it all out pretty quickly um you know a lot of it was just trying to figure out how something like this would sneak into the world um you know it's not just going to be like plopped in front of everybody like hey now you can back yourself up now it's it's going to slowly work its way in so I mean a lot of it is just you know the way our world works already and just riffing off of that. Um, There's plenty of examples uh, of, you know, people unleashing this technology on the world and then other people using it in ways that they completely did not anticipate. Okay. Um, Tell me about uh, Natalie Winters and basically what her role in the overall story is, because she's basically like the main character for this. Yeah, she's our main character. She's, you know, she grew up, uh, a latchkey kid of a single mom and they always struggled and so most of her life she was she dreamed of having a life where she was comfortable and they didn't have to move all the time and you know the sort of uh cliche american dream of like having a a successful husband and a nice house and and a job that you hopefully like um and now she has all that and she's still not I guess what you'd call happy, like she's content, but not happy. So uh, then her file basically gets leaked online and people start generating copies of her and they're all kind of bootlegs. So they're not exactly her, but they're close enough. And these, these copies of her start, they all are operating from the premise that they are her and they remember, you know, uh, all the, pin codes for ATMs and bank accounts. So they start accessing all that stuff and basically turning her life into complete chaos. 
Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's a, it's like not even like just that, but it's also these are like alternate versions of her. Um, one thing that I read was that you know part of the story is giving you the chance to sort of sort of see how your life could have gone. How does postscript allow you to do that though? I mean, it's it's not an intended effect, but basically, you know, all these people are grabbing copies of her her file, and a lot of them are messing with it, or you know, it. it it's not you know perfectly loaded into a body so it's it's her but it's a different aspect of hers and the thing i really latched onto is this idea of you know as you go through life there are all these paths that you initially have mapped out in front of you and a million things you want to do and as you keep moving forward you know you move past the entrances to some of these paths and you know, you get to a point where you start to wonder, like, what if I had done that? Or what if I had done that? And so now, basically, all these copies of her are out there chasing after these dreams that she gave up on, um, which seemed like the the biggest recipe for for chaos. Uh, And yeah, uh, you know, they also, a lot of them are a lot more forward than her and, you know, are telling people in her life exactly how they feel about them. Uh, and you know, so it's a, it's a weird, uh, it's like the best and worst parts of yourself are out there operating without your permission. (laughs) And I'm sure that works out perfectly fine. Um, oh yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, you mentioned before that Natalie is content, but not happy. Do we see signs of that in the, uh, the first issue? Yeah. I mean, you know, she, I mean, she's got it all. And, you know, we make sure to show that, like, you know, here's her amazing life and, you know, everything's going well. Um, but definitely, yeah, I, I did my best to to make it. Uh, I've definitely gotten comments from people of like, well, why isn't she more happy with her husband? It's like, I don't I don't know. I was like, I could get into it, but it's going to be a very boring book if I go back and, you know, make a chart of all the reasons that. <laughs> You know, they're not getting along. Um, so, yeah, it's like, you know, she has all the pieces, but they're not, I don't know, they're not uh, exactly what she pictured. So, you know, it's the same as any, you know, you you dream about like achieving this thing and then you achieve it. And it's like, oh, crap, there's still like a hole in me. Uh, like this didn't completely you know, fulfill me and make me perfect. Uh, so I think it's just, yeah, an extrapolation of that. Okay. All right. Um, I want to um, ask about the team you work. How did you all meet and did you ever work together before? Didia and I did. We worked on a book called House of Muck together, which was a creator owned book I did about a family that goes insane together. Um, and yeah, I, I loved working with him. So I wanted to do it again. Uh, Kara was somebody whose stuff I've always liked and have always wanted to work with, but I could never, I could never figure out how that was going to happen. I just knew I couldn't afford to pay her, uh, what, you know, her page rates are. And so it was just this weird pocket dream I had. And when we set the book up at comiXology, uh, suddenly I was like, Oh, I can, now I can afford to pay you. Um, and I don't know her, her stuff, it's just super charming and light and I wanted to see what this story would look like through her eyes. Um, and she picked Rebecca. Uh, I'm, I'm terrible. I I can just like look at colors and go, well, I like that or I don't like that. And that's not a very useful skill to have in, in comics. So I stayed out of the way. Uh, but yeah, Rebecca and Cara work really great together. It's a beautiful book, even if, you know, you're not into the story, you can't deny that it looks really good. Mm-hmm. Now, do you usually give a lot of like input to the artist as to like what you're looking for for the art? No, I try to stay. I like, yeah, that's not my job. So, um, I I don't want to do anything that like makes the art that makes an artist feel like, oh, I'm operating under like these 17 rules that I have to abide by. Um, I just, you know, I. I give them my scripts. I give them a bunch of supplemental material right at the beginning. That's like, here's what, you know, each of these characters is like, and here's what their past was like. So it's, it's like having a conversation with them, but it pretty much, I just let them run wild. Um, 
because I think that's how you get the best comics is, you know, everybody's doing their own thing, but it all somehow, uh, you know, melts together perfectly. Mm -hmm. Um, now looking back at, at, at um, some of your, uh, your past titles, uh, it looks like you've worked on a number of like creator owned projects. Uh, how did that like come mm -hmm. to be? Um, I just have a lot of stories in my head and, uh, I mean, as soon as I got my first one out, I was like, oh, this is something I can do. Um, like, I can do more of these. So I've just, it's just more satisfying to me. Like, these are my stories. I'm building my own worlds. Um, I don't have to follow, you know, working uh, on licensed stuff or on, like, superhero stuff. There's so many, again, rules that you have to follow. Like, especially with superhero stuff, you know, there's 70 years of history with some of these characters. And you can't. You can't do something that violates the established history. And also, there, you know, there are like at times four different versions uh, of this. Like there are four different books with the same character. And so if one book is doing something, well, you can't do that because they're doing that. You know, it's it's just a minefield. Uh, but with creator on stuff, it's like only I can tell myself not to do something Um I don't know. I just like the freedom of it, of being able to build my own worlds. And like, I can make characters who are not necessarily super likable. Um, I can take my time. I can kind of do whatever. So once I got a taste for it, it's like, this is all I really want to do. Yeah. I, it's funny because I, because I, I think like a lot of folks, you know, they grow up wanting to work for like Marvel, DC, uh, Dark Horse, and like like mm -hmm. and, and like the big name companies. But it seems like these days the industry has kind of shifted where it's more possible to do your own thing and actually like make a living off of it. Yeah, I mean that was always the tricky part. I think for a lot of creators was trying to work in comics full time and stay alive, and so. Yeah, working on licensed and uh, work for hire stuff was a lot more necessary. But now there's a lot more publishers. There's a lot more. Uh, the market is just bigger. We have more readers. I don't know. It's it's a very different world. But I'm grateful that there's enough room in it that I can tell my weird little stories and enough people show up to make it worth everybody's everybody's time and effort yeah and 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 your stories are very weird but in a very very good way like i um i've i've read a uh, crowded before and i think like the first few pages i was so hooked on this it's like huh weird like a weird world where this like icon where the entire economy is run by like job share apps and get mm -hmm. these characters who are so wonderfully despicable but you just hooked them anyway you want to just kind of keep on reading um <laughs> Um, I'm curious about like developing characters. Um, like what kind of work goes into creating uh, these folks? Uh, yeah, characters are what I focus on most. Like once I get the idea and kind of work out that, then characters are the big, they're the fun part. Um, you know, I mean, basically you, I don't know, you, you figure out who you want in it and then for me, at least, I like to go through and build sort of a past life for them before our story starts. So I have a general idea of like, you know, here's how they were raised. Here's the traumas that went on with them. I don't, you're just, uh, I don't know. You pick a lot from people that you know and from just uh there's just so many different sources to create a person um and i know you're mostly just trying to create especially in in terms of like protagonists you're trying to create somebody that you want to spend six months to a year or more of your life hanging out with so that's the that's the hardest part it's like you want to make them alive and flawed but you also don't want to make them so obnoxious that like every time you have to sit down and write them you're like why did i why did i create you uh, <laughs> i hate you so much why are you even here <laughs> i feel like there must be people out there who have like yeah you're just like the the machine runs things and you're just in service to this character and it's like uh like i wish i could just like really like make your life difficult uh, 
how do you know when a character just isn't working when they're just like not fitting into the story and you have to scrap them and start over again? I mean, it's, it's a really, I, I used to hate uh, when writers talk like this, but I think it's true. Like they'll tell you if like, if you're trying to make them do things that they wouldn't do. Um, I feel like if, if you've established it well enough in your head, like they begin to sort of dictate how they're going to react to any given situation. So sometimes you have a character that's just, um, you know, sometimes you're like, why are you even here? Like, what are you doing here? Um, and sometimes you have characters who are, yeah, running, uh, their whole nature sort of runs counter to what you need them to do. Um, you know, it's trial and error. Like sometimes you have to write a whole, you have to write a whole issue or, ideally not more than that before you figure it out uh but I, I don't know that you really have to scrap them you just have to massage them into being slightly more of who you need um it's very really weird to talk about it this way um but yeah you're you're just sort of creating a a, a person who who fits all your narrative needs mm -hmm. but is still still kind of alive enough that they're going to do what they want Okay. I don't know how you do that. Yeah. <laughs> man, hey, me neither, man. I do I do not I do not do that kind of stuff. I don't write characters. I just talk about them. Mm -hmm. Um so going back uh to Natalie Winters, you know, like as, as the story progresses, I'm sure we'll dive more into, you know, what happened, how she got hacked, what's gonna happen with all these like copies of herself. Is she sort of the like detective solving the mystery, or is she just kind of just going along and sort of seeing things as they happen? I mean, she gets more proactive as it goes, but she's very much like caught up in something much bigger than her at first, and is trying to basically trying to get her life to go back to the way it was, even if it's like a, not necessarily a life she was super crazy about. She just wants to to get back to at least something stable. So a lot of her is reactive at first. And then once she starts meeting more copies of herself and realizing she can't, like, I don't know, excuse herself from the situation, she she grows a little bit more active. I mean, that's kind of what you want a, a character to do is is to at least like if the character doesn't care about what's going on it's hard to make a reader care about what's going on oh yeah yeah definitely definitely now why does she want to get back to the comfort zone so badly like why not have like um uh, have an adventure and you know see where this kind of thing leads her sure um uh, just because you know she's she's very much she she thinks she's had her adventure like you know her her life growing up was a lot of like, I don't know. Some people would use it, I guess, as like street cred of like, oh, here's like here's the crappy way I grew up, uh, like to kind of show off that they're not, you know, bougie or whatever. But for Natalie, it was it was very much like, here's everything I had to go through to get to where I am, and I, you know, she doesn't want to go back, even if it means you know, having to sort of suck it up and and accept some things. I mean, it's, I think it's the same for all of us. You know, you, you encounter some situations where it's like, well, this is not ideal. Um, but you know, it's better than complete, you know, everything being on fire all the time. I don't know, man. Some folks just deal well with chaos. I mean, I'm not one of them. I kind of like my routines. So, you know, yeah. for things to totally fall apart, that's what makes me fall apart. Yeah. I mean, Natalie's just not that kind of person. Like, uh, you know, like Charlie, our main character from Crowded, is somebody who that kind of thrives on chaos. Oh, so yes. If if this happened to her, uh, you know, it'd be a much different story. But yeah, Natalie is just somebody who's kind of looking for, you know, she she doesn't want to be like big and important. She doesn't want to be you know uh, sexy and famous. She just wants to have like a life that she she loves, hmm. uh, which I think all of us are are in search of. Yeah, uh, she's uh, she's uh, kind of like the uh, the uh, the anti Charlie. And for the folks who who yes. you know don't know, Charlie is one of the main characters from Crowded, and more or less the in in this world, she uh, becomes the target of this like assassination app where you can take out a hit on anyone you want, basically. And there's a massive hit on her. She has to try to figure out who did it, 
why it's at, you know, like why this is why uh, this is happening. But like you said, she thrives in that chaos. She just jumps from like fire to fire. And I can tell like Natalie's that's just like totally the opposite of like her as a as a person. Yeah. And that's, you know, fun for me. Like I mean, I one one way that sort of guides me in writing characters is, you know, I don't wanna I don't wanna do like two Charlies in a row. Um because that's just too uh, too much and I don't want to do two two Natalie's in a row because that's kind of too somber and serene I guess so uh, the same way you know you want to have an interesting group of friends I want to have like a bunch of characters who don't all like point at each other and like oh you're me um, I get you I get you now when, when it comes to like um, uh, making the characters do you really try and avoid making like the same person twice like either in a row or at all? Yeah, I mean, I don't think about it too much, but I think I can definitely tell when somebody's leaning a little too much in a direction that another character has already gone, uh, especially with uh, just writing Charlie uh, in Crowded was just super fun every time. Um, so it's kind of addictive. And <laughs> you know, now that I'm, I'm done writing the book, our third and final volumes coming out next year, uh, like, I, I miss it, but, uh, but yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to be the dude who's just writing the same person over and over. Uh, it's just, I don't know. Yeah. I, I want to dig into new people who are messed up in different ways, I guess. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, as we go along with Natalie and hopefully I don't want to give me any kind of spoilers here, but do we find out more secrets about her? Yeah, I mean, you find you find more out about her through her her blanks. Basically, the copies of her are sort of our window into her more than like she sits down and kind of lays herself out, which I I thought was a fun way to kind of approach digging into a character. It's like you're not the character isn't necessarily opening up, but all these different aspects of them keep like physically showing up and and physically like imposing themselves on her life so you you get a, a deeper look at her but it's through all these different bodies okay now as i mentioned earlier this is only available through comiXology originals if you don't know now you know it's six bucks a month you get access to thousands upon thousands of digital titles from the big two down to like total like indie creators um chris a question to you um how did you come to the attention of comiXology was this your first time working together uh yeah um i i uh i'd been talking with somebody over there shortly after uh the original line launched and you know we sort of chatted and then we met at new york comic-con in 2019 and i kind of pitched them right there standing in front of the javits center uh and they were into it enough that they were like, yeah, drop me a line when all the chaos is over and we'll talk. And I, it was just crazy easy. Like I just sent along dot self was the idea I had that I felt the most confident in at that time. So I sent that over and they were like, yeah, we'd love it. Like, do you want to make this? And I was like, okay, I guess so. Uh, like it, it there's some, I, like pitching stuff to publishers, like sometimes it's such a long process. Like this went so quickly that all of a sudden it's like, oh, crap, now I have to actually write it. <laughs> Whoops. And here we are. And uh, and and for, the, and for the folks at home, uh, the second issue of this series comes out on December 7th. And and so definitely keep it to Comixology for all the updates. You definitely want to uh, read this series. I am totally loving it. But we're going to actually right. jump track for a quick second here talk, to talk about a new series you're working on. There's currently a Kickstarter for this going until December 11th. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. called, it's called A Foul Brood. Which right off the bat, mm -hmm. I love the name. The name just hit me like right there, like absolutely. <laughs> and this has you working with artist Claire Rowe, who has worked on titles such as Batgirl and the Birds of Prey, Bury the Lead, and Nebula. But you two actually worked together before on on um, uh, Welcome Back. Uh, yeah, what's it been like getting a chance to work together again? Uh, awesome. Like uh, Claire's one of my uh, favorite collaborators I've ever had. Like Welcome Back's one of my favorite books I've ever done. So pretty much from the moment it ended, I was, I started bugging her. I was like, Hey, we should work on something else together. 
she was like yeah sure that'd be great uh, and then you know she went off and did some uh some big fancy work and i just kept i just kept bugging her like every every six months or so i was like hey i got this what do you think of this um and then in march of 2020 we were all set to start uh work on a book about a pandemic that kills millions of people and i reached out to her i was like i don't think we should do this book uh, <laughs> no no not a good idea <laughs> so uh so I was like, yeah, we shouldn't do this, but I have this story about bees and crime and would you be interested? So I sent her the script and she loved it. And yeah, then we started making a uh, foul brood. Like it was, uh, after, after all the like secret prayers I've been making it, it uh, us actually like working together again, just sort of felt right in my lap. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny that you that you say that you kept like bugging her, and now we have this title about you know bees and crime and bees and crime coming yeah. uh, coming together. Uh, where did the concept come from? Because this is a very cool, like gritty, like um, uh, crime noir kind of story. Um, it comes. The origin is from an actual news story that I think was in 2017, but uh, a guy got busted with all these hives he had been stealing uh in northern california uh because there's a whole market for uh people who run apiaries they can rent their bees out to farmers in order to help you know pollinate their crops and get better results so this guy had been going onto the farms in the middle of the night and stealing hives and just collecting them in this empty lot and finally he got busted and uh one of the cops in the news story about it was quoted as saying it was like a chop shop of stolen bees. And that, that was such a good phrase that like immediately I was like, I have to do something with this. Like that's, I you know, it's like cellar door from uh, Donnie Darko. It's like just one of those phrases that you hear and it like speaks to something deep inside you. And I was like, I have to do something about bees and crime. So that's, uh, yeah, for the last three, four years, I've been working on it. You know, as someone who uh, works in the media, you you wait your whole career to hear that kind of phrase. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, a a chop shop of stolen bees. You wait your whole life to be able to be able to write that kind of quote down. Yeah, it was like, yeah, I I it was just like I'm never going to see this. Like nobody's ever going to say that sentence again. <laughs> uh, it was just yeah. Uh, I couldn't resist from that point in. Uh, I was I was completely hooked. Oh man! Now at this point in time, uh, the uh, your Kickstarter goal is um, uh, fifteen thousand dollars, and you're a little bit under a uh, ten grand. What are some of the tiers in the Kickstarter? Um, you know, we're we're doing digital copies. We're doing physical copies. It's the first two issues. They're already completed, so uh, it's the first two issues. That way, you can get other books of mine sent along um you can get claire to do a digital commission for you um i have a couple tiers where i will make a custom video of my dog for you <laughs> i want that tier i want that thing yeah like it's uh my dog is very popular on my more popular than i am on my social <laughs> media so i'm finally <laughs> learning how to exploit my dog for money <laughs> Hey man, everyone everyone else is these days. You may as well. Yeah, like this is why. I, but this is why I don't give her her own account. Like people set up accounts, Instagram accounts, just for their pets. And I was like, no, you have to, you have to wallow through my content if you want to <laughs> see my dog. So <laughs> that is some good marketing. I like that. <laughs> it's very stubborn. Yes. <laughs> Stubborn, that's a good word for it. All right, all right. Well, Chris, man, I have been loving talking uh, with you about this. Of course, loving the series, folks. If you, if you haven't actually checked it out yet, please do so on Comixology Originals. Go to comicsology.org for more information. If you've got an Amazon account, you can already sign up. Again, six bucks a month, thousands of titles. You can't go wrong. Uh, now, Chris, uh, before we go, uh, where do folks go to check out your work and learn more about you? Uh, Well, I have a regular website that's just christopher um and then online like social media wise i'm mostly on twitter and that's uh, at xtop xtop that's also my name on instagram so anywhere else i'm not <laughs> 
active at all. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, once again, Chris, loving the series, and I cannot wait to check out issue two. Thank you very much. Picture this. You finished your first book and nailed it. The plot, the characters, all the twists and turns. This one's a winner, and all you need is the right cover. If you've got my art skills, this is the part where panic usually sets in. Enter the cover villain, hero to writers everywhere. Founded by noted author Remy Flagg, cover villain focuses on composite image covers for science fiction and fantasy writers. Give them the details, and they'll craft a cover using popular trends that everyone will want to see. But wait, you say, I've got ideas of my own. No problem, as cover villain loves a good collaboration. As they say, our goal is to put a little villain in every cover we make. Want to know more? Then head to CoverVillain.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that one. Big thanks to Chris for joining me. And if you hadn't already checked it out, definitely download the first issue of Dot Self, only available on Comixology Originals. Episode 2 comes out December 7th, and there's still time to be a contributor for his new Kickstarter for his upcoming release, Foul Brood. It's bees, crime, and crime involving bees. What more can you ask for? Coming up next, I welcome back artist Sal Abenanti to talk about the upcoming release of the omnibus edition of his classic title, Atomica God is Red. Sal also has a Kickstarter going, and this one runs until December 2nd. It's already well past the $25,000 goal, and we talk about that and the vast list of artists that are contributing to this new edition. Sal dives into the history of the title and all the challenges he faced when trying to get it published. Joining me now, well, we had him on the show last back in February to talk about his uh, then recently released title, The Hostage. Sal Abenanti joins me to talk about the publication, the omnibus edition of his classic cult comic, Atomica, God is Red. Sal, welcome back, man. It's great to have you here. Hey, man, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course, man, of course. Now, uh, as we talked about prior to me hitting the record button, you have a Kickstarter going on. This one ends on December 2nd, so just almost over, folks. It's still a chance to uh, to get involved. But you've already beat your goal. You have uh, you had a goal of $25,000. You're now at about a little under $40,000. That's, that's damn impressive, dude. That's damn impressive. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I mean, these... I, I got to be honest. I never approach these things with, uh, you know, the idea of having it unlimited. I'm, I'm just, I'm happy when we hit the, the hardcover. We were originally going to do it as a, um, I, you know, as a trade, as a, as a, a soft cover trade. But then when we hit the goal, we went ahead and we could now we could do it as a hardcover. So it's pretty exciting. And yeah. Then, you know, you're, you're, and then uh, you know, I mean, people like all that extra stuff too. So you really got to do all that stuff. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so what's unlocked with your current funding level now? Yeah. And then, and then, you know, you, once you, 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 you kind of create, it's necessary to create perks, you know, to say thank you for the amount of supporters you get and backers and things like that. So we've already got, we've opened the, you know, there's also going to be lots of, other stuff included now at this point for everybody who who um, supports it at any level they'll get the trading cards and they get sticker packages and we're we're working on our next couple of stretch goals and we're and and i've got so much cool stuff to offer with this because i i had got a lot of guys to do covers and pinups and and back covers and things like that that i just didn't want a lot of this stuff to kind of go to waste or to not be seen so there were there were a few artists that you know, that contributed that didn't get seen in the book when the book was originally published. So this book has a lot of extra stuff that the individual issues didn't have. I mean, it's like, it's over 300 pages. Wow. I want to talk about the, uh, as you mentioned, the never, uh, uh, the never before seen art in this one, you've got so many big names, John Romina senior, Alex Ross, many others. How'd you get involved with these folks? Like how'd you get them to become like a part of this project? Well, at the time I was doing a lot of cons. I mean, when I, when you put out a, when I was, um, you know, originally thinking of becoming an indie publisher, I was doing a lot of shows. I was setting up an artist alley and a lot of them, you know, just, you get to know through the years just by attending cons. And then, you know, I had funded the book myself originally when it was individual issues. So 
I went about it with no delusions that when you're an individual, when you're an independent publisher and you're coming out of nowhere, you really kind of need an ability to market the book. So I knew it was important to have, you know, name some kind of brand recognition of artists that people would recognize just so that comic stores would, would at least give it a shot because comic stores, if they, you know, a lot of comic stores are not big on indie titles because, you know, they, if they don't sell, they got to eat it, you know, they're, and comic stores like to, you know, they've got a lot of brand loyalty in their comics. So I just started hitting up these guys at shows and, and, and not asking for, you know, for favors. I paid everybody and, and, you know, you get a lot of, Oh, let me think about it. Knows, But at the end of the day, if you need, you know, you need 10 covers, you ask 20 people and maybe you'll get 10. I get you. I get you. All right. So, so let's talk a bit about the story behind Atomic God is Red. What is this title about? When I knew, I, I mean, I tried for a lot of years to get in and they just, they were not in, they would not be, you know, they wouldn't let me into their party. So I just decided, you know, it was either I was just going to give it up and go back to advertising and I was working at the bar or do it myself. So Growing up in the 70s, Russia was, you know, always the evil empire. So I just always thought it was a really cool setting for a title because I grew up an enormous Kirby fan, especially with New Gods. New Gods was like the book that kind of made me want to become an artist. So as I started to research it, I just realized, you know what? There's a lot of similarities there with what was going on in the and you know, the world we live in now with what happened in the Soviet Union, where they, they had told the, the when they declared the state was their God, they literally told their people, the state is your God. Religion's all counterproductive. So in a way, they created their own God. And so to me, that became a metaphor for like the God of the 20th century, which is technology. So that's basically who Atomica is. It's not a religious title. It's not a political title. It, it's just kind of a what if. Of, of my love of Kirby and New Gods. And then I also grew up a big John Buscema Thor fan, which was all based on Greek mythology. And this is kind of, uh, this was based around Russian mythology. Yeah. I, um, reading the story behind this thing, you know, like, um, Atomica being the first like man made deity, the god of the, as right. you said, the god of technology. Right. He's conquered the world and now basically taking on the gods themselves. Uh, that is such like and like and like epic story. You mentioned Kirby, of course. You know he's done some pretty epic stories too. So I'm wondering, are there like specific stories that this kind of reflects? It really was, you know, it was my love of, it was my love of of you know Marvel classic Marvel comics. Growing up with Thor, you know, and with um, you know classic Kirby stuff that it kind of been you know was my you know inspiration. But it was also there was a lot of angst and there was there's a lot of um, hostility so to speak in that book of not being able to break into comics they just would i could not get into comics i mean i went to every portfolio review i went to every you know convention i met with every editor and it just wasn't happening so i had just decided you know what it was time for me to to you know just do it myself and put my money where my mouth is so i just poured you know all my angst and all my uh my frustration and, and desire to be an artist into Atomica and just to say, Hey man, I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> so, you know, I guess I had nothing to lose and my style I knew was just not the house style. It was not what they were looking for. So at some point you got to face reality of like, Hey, look, you're either going to do it yourself and, or you're just going to decide to do something else. Mm. And, and, and I wasn't ready to give it up. I think if you have a story to tell, you should you should never give up. Even if you get told by like big names in whatever industry you're trying to break into that, oh yeah, this will never sell, this will never make it. I think if you got the idea and you got the passion, you got to see it through. Even if you got to do it yourself. Well, you know, I mean, in Chicago, I you know, I was I bartended a lot, you know, to pay the bills and get by, and and in a lot of the the inner city neighborhoods where I worked there was a lot of independent theaters, you know, the remains theater that, that William Peterson started the Steppenwolf theater. And it was started by, you know, Malkovich and Gary Sinise and those guys. So these were guys that just basically, I, I took some inspiration from that of to say, Hey, if you want to be an actor, not necessarily a movie star at some point, if you're not making it, you got to just decide to do it yourself and set up a little theater and all. And, you know, so 
what happened with with comics is that desktop publishing became a lot more affordable in the 90s. It used to be if you wanted to put a book out, you had to go to a printer. And if you if you printed the printer, you know, you told them you were not going to print 100,000 copies. He told you, forget it. Or you needed, you know, fifty thousand dollars to print a comic. Well, that wasn't the case anymore because technology changed. So if you were willing to do all the sweat which is what 99% of a comic is, is basically just you sitting down and drawing for free. And then, you know, you got to put your money up to go to the printer. And, and, you know, if you decide to work digitally with a letterer and a colorist and that type of thing, it's doable. And the, the, this, you know, the medium needs independent creators more than ever because comics are becoming distilled down to just a very finite type of product now with Marvel and DC. They, they're they're presenting. They're, they're not going to show. They don't want anything new. They want the the style that is the house style, you know, the popular style. And they're only really interested in the licensed characters. That's really where they're more. You know, that that's what they focus on. They're not going to focus on the creators. They're only going to focus on what they own, which is the licenses. So I tell people all the time who ask me, "Oh, how do I get into comics?" I'm like, "Well, don't ask me because I couldn't get in. You know, I had to." I had to open my own, you know, hot dog stand because, you know, they weren't, you know, and do it yourself, man. It's not rocket science anymore. Like it used to be. It's, you know, you could print 50 copies. You can print a hundred copies and get your name out there and get your work out there. And, and you, you know, it shuffle the deck where you create a situation where maybe these publishers will start coming to you instead of you having to go to them to look for work because they see what you're doing and they like it. Exactly, exactly. And I think these days that uh, that's becoming a lot easier. There's a lot more like indie presses out there. There's a lot more like I I, I just kind of feel like it, it has become a lot easier for people to put out their own ideas than it was, say, like 10, 20, 30 uh, years ago. Um, one thing I'm, I'm just kind of curious, and this is more of a hypothetical question. Do you think if you try to publish Atomica today, it it would like do better? You know, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I mean, the business has changed a lot since I put out Atomica. I mean, when I put out when I put it out originally, the business model was was very it, it was the same business model that it had been for for a long time, which is you put an ad in previews and in and, and the preview catalog and the preview catalog goes to the comic stores and then they flip through it and decide what they want and what they don't want. Well, you know, if you're an indie guy. Your, your, your ad goes way in the back. You're behind Marvel, you're behind DC, and you know, you're know you lucky if you can get a shake. Now, with crowdfunding and with social media and with things like that, at least you can get the word out. Now, there's no cons. You know, there's no trade shows to do. There's no conventions to go and kind of bang the drum. So when COVID hit, it forced everybody in the business to kind of pivot and have to find new ways to deliver their product and you know, let the consumer see it, let the, let the comic fan see it. And, and indie books are, it's crowdfunding is perfect for indie titles because the fan base that buys indie titles likes to see the book. They like all this, the, the extra stuff. They like to see the process. They like to feel that they're working one-to-one with the creator and not the publisher. And there's no filter between the two. So for me, I was not a fan of crowdfunding when this started. I thought, wow, I don't know if I can do this. But then once I saw you can make a video, you can give them extras, you could show your process. I could give you sample pages to see, you know, and it's kind of like if you're, you know, you're a band. If you suck, they'll tell you, you know, they'll throw shit at you. You'll know right away you're not any good. And it's the same with Kickstarter. You I, you get the feedback right away. You'll get the messages saying, hey, what's this? What's that? I don't like this. I like that. And that that feedback is is important, especially because we don't have cons. You know, all the cons for the last two years are, are gone. So you can't get out there and meet the, you know, the fan base directly. So I, I don't know. I mean, that's why when we start when I did the hostage, I, I'll be honest, it was an indie title, very indie. And I didn't expect us to be able to make enough to fund it. And I was overwhelmed with the response. I mean, I couldn't believe how well it did. So with Atomica, I had it published by an Eastern European publisher, Darkwood, they were called in, in um, Croatia published it as a hardcover. And they, I was like, wow, they did a, they did a really nice job with it. So I thought, 
well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I could do it here now as, a, as an omnibus. I don't know if, if you know, I, it, w- it would have done so well before. Because when I first published Atomica to do an omnibus, I, I would have had to have printed, you know, 50,000 copies. And, and, and then they drop a pallet of books in your living room and then you got to figure out how you're going to sell them. You know, because comic stores are not going to buy an omnibus of an independent title that they've never heard of because they don't want to have to buy it and then eat it if they don't sell it. So I, I honestly don't think I could have done an omnibus when, when Atomic originally came out. Mm-hmm. And, you know? but, but now man, it's happening. It's happening in a very, very big way. Uh, does it surprise you just the response this Kickstarter has gotten? Oh man, I'm, I, I can't believe it. I mean, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I, I really am. I mean, as an indie creator, you kind of know going in, it's a rigged poker game. You know, it's tough. You know, there's only, there's only a small segment of the audience that buys indie titles. That's just how it is. It's like cigarettes. You know, people got their brands and they stick with them and that's how it goes. And you know, you know, they, they, they got their Superman, they got their Wolverine, they got their Batman. They don't want your version of it. So you really got to kind of just do it with the idea of, man, I don't have a choice. You know, being being a, a, an artist, whether you're a, a musician or an artist or an actor or a writer, whatever it is, you better love it and you better do it because you don't have a choice. Because if you're doing it and you're motivated by, you know, they're going to make, you know, like, a, a, you know, somebody's like, hey, Vin Diesel would be a great atomic. I'm like, guys, I have no delusions that they're going to make atomic into a movie. That's not why I did it. You know, I did it because I really don't have a choice. I mean, I, I really had to be an artist and, you know, it's like being bit by a vampire. <laughs> I like that, man. It's good. I you like know? that, man. Although, uh, it, although I got to say like Vin Diesel in that movie would probably be, would probably be really cool. Uh, well, Hey, anybody who wants to do it, you know, uh, I'll give up my phone number, but I don't see it happening because there, there's a, there's a lot of that. You get a lot of guys that create titles just thinking it's going to get optioned as a movie and God bless you if it happens, but that's, that's, you know, th- th- those things are far and few between that, that kind of stuff doesn't happen all the time. And, you know, when you want to be an artist, you know, it's like running off and joining the circus. You know, the circus doesn't need you, man. You need the circus. Mm-hmm. Now, now, yeah. now, we talked a bit about cons, and of course, as you said, the last couple of years we've we've had none. They've all they've all been canceled, shut down because of COVID. But they are yeah. starting to come back. Have you been out there going to the cons since they begin to reopen? I I kind of I mean we're planning on them for next year. I mean I, I mean for twenty two because right now I think you know it's nice to see people going and kicking the tires. And and trying them out, you know, we had New York and then we had, we have San Diego this weekend and we, you know, we got Chicago coming up in December, but it's still void of exhibitors. It's still void of publishers and big companies. So right now it seems to be more um, fans, but just just primarily retailers. And a lot of I think because a lot of people are still a little bit leery of things. But I think once we get this, you know, winter under our belt and the kids are all vaccinated and now that they, now that you can, people can come from overseas and, and the the borders are open, I think we'll be back. uh, You know, we'll really be back in full force next year, you know, which is, which isn't that far away. Exactly. And I was actually at uh, Ryland comic con a couple weeks ago and, you know, the first day was a little nervous because I it's the first time I've been in any kind of crowd situation in almost two years. So the first day I was like, all right, we'll just kind of feel things out. The second day was surprisingly packed, actually. I, I was expecting crowds to be kind of small, but I think there's that desire to be back again that now this is an option. Everyone's like, yeah, let's do it. A lot of folks were, you know, dressed up, a lot of co- really cool cosplays and it was kind of cool to see people see people being respectful. Pretty much like everyone there was like masked up, so it was nice to see that. Yeah. you know, common yeah. courtesy for everyone else. Sure. We talked a bit about the struggle of getting this thing, you know, in front of people. What were some of the responses you got when you were like pitching this to the publishers? Oh, forget it. It was. It was. You forget. <laughs> and no, there were there were no responses. That was just. They were like, no, man, this is your work is too disturbing. 
is what they told me. Oh, really? I mean, oh, yeah. No, it was a straight rejection. And then, you know, you reach a point where you just say, all right, enough of it. I'm not asking anymore. I'm just doing it myself. You know, I mean, I didn't I didn't approach any publishers with this because I knew what they I knew what they were going to say. I had heard it for years. I'd heard that rejection. And then you reach a point where you're just like, you know what, man? Uh, you know, I, if you're not going to let me in, you know, play in your reindeer games, then I'm just going to do my own thing over here. Exactly. So, yeah. So, and you learn a lot by doing it yourself. You, you realize, look, it's not that, it's not like jumping out of an airplane, you know, where if you, where if you screw it up, somebody gets killed. It, you're, you're putting out a comic and you're going to learn a lot and you're going to make mistakes. And some of your stuff you're going to look back on and go, wow, that wasn't, you know, very good. But, I guarantee you, if you're if you're working hard and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you know, given time, your stuff will get better. Mm -hmm. What were some of the big lessons you got from publishing Atomica? Try to do as much of it as you can yourselves. Uh, Don't have any delusions about how people are going to respond because it's tough. You know, it's 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 the comic business is not going to put their arms around you and give you a big kiss. You better you better love it and you better do it because you really really have to do it or or forget it you better not expect to like you know get rich because people think oh once you publish a book you can quit your job it's like no that that doesn't happen <laughs> nope uh, you know <laughs> you think oh sal i, I want to you know my god you know you got your own publishing yeah mercury comic that's that's my kitchen table basically mercury comics i mean that that's that's me I publish it myself and you just pay the bills is basically what it means to be a publisher. Mm -hmm. Uh, Find good people. I mean, when I did Atomica, I found a really good inker, a friend of mine who was, who was really good. And he, he helped and make the, you know, and tightened it up and made my work look more professional, you know, get a good colorist. If you can afford one, get somebody who's, who, you know, can really kind of give it that professional look, um, and and then from there, you know, you could approach different printers. The harder thing now versus when I published Atomica is that most of the printers are gone now. We just don't print as much in this in this country anymore because of the internet. Everybody just has you know websites. They don't really do a lot of catalogs and so so a lot of the printers are gone. so, which is why a lot of the printing has gone overseas. I had to print the hostage overseas. Because my last few printers, they just don't exist anymore. So, you know, shop around. You, you'd be amazed on, on how you can get, you know, good prices if you just kind of look around a little bit mm-hmm. of, of what stuff costs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, agreed, yeah. agreed. Now, having this thing out in, in like, the Omnibus Edition, do you feel like, do, do you feel like this is the version that you always wanted to do? I want, I loved individual issues. I did Atomic Goes 12 individual issues because I was old school and I loved, I loved that. I did, I did not, I was not a fan of going straight to trades. Whereas in the nineties, trades became really popular. Everybody loved trades because, you know, you can kind of like what we do now when, you know, you binge watch a television show, you can just fire through it and, and get a momentum going with the story. Well, that was kind of the problem with Atomica was that, with an indie title, some stores will pick up the book and then some won't. And then there's, there's, there tends to be a gap there sometimes of, of, of the story not coming out consistently. So um, this to me is, is a dream come true because I can not only put the whole story together, but I can put all the extra stuff in there, all the covers, all the extra pinups. And then this com- you know, this company, Overseas, they put together an entire supplement inside there, which is uh, kind of a backstory of all the mythological characters that appear in the book. So there's a lot of extra stuff that was not in the comic that, you know, really kind of fleshes it out and gives you a lot of backstory of what's going on. Yeah, I I especially love that you've got you've got um, the wraparound cover that Alex Ross did. Yeah. Yeah. Alex is a, is a, is a dear friend of mine. So when I asked him, when I approached him about it, he was just kind of like, Hey, when do you need it? So (laughs) I was really, yeah, I was really fortunate that way. I, I, I mean, but that was, again, that was, I knew that I needed some kind of a marketing hook. I, I, I mean, you know, I, you got to put your ego aside. You got to find, you know, if, if just to get people to pick the book up and give my, my, my stuff a shot if if the you know if the comic stores bought it and picked it up because it had the alex ross cover 
good. I mean, I can live with that because I know they need to sell comics. So if, if you picked it up because you saw Alex Ross's cover and then you flipped through it, then to me, that was half the battle was won. Cause at least, you know, I got you to take a look at my work and, you know, if you decided it wasn't your thing, I could live with that, but just getting comp, you know, just getting stores to pick the damn thing up is not, you know, is, is two thirds of the battle. Oh yeah, man. Definitely. Definitely. So, yeah. And Alex, Alex, you know, he really knocked it out of the park. I mean, he did a great job. Oh, a- absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this will be out pretty soon, of course. You know, the Kickstarter, as you mentioned, ends on December second. What's going to happen after that? Do you, do you think you'll be doing like the cons? We be doing just more yeah, like. Yeah, no, I think I'd like to. I'd like to to offer. You know, if it, it you know did well. I mean, it's doing well now. I mean, knock wood. And and I'd like to offer it. You know, to comic stores afterwards. I don't know how that's going to go. I'd like to order it through Diamond so that people can pick it up you know, at comic stores, it's a little harder because, you know, it's a trade, it's a bigger, it's a 300 page omnibus. So it'll probably be at, you know, 40, $45 uh, price tag at comic stores, which is a tougher sell. So, but yeah, I absolutely want to get it out there into comic stores along with the hostage, because that was, that's really my goal is to get it into, into comic books hands. I didn't, I didn't want it to be, you know, feel like it was a select market and it was only going to be available through Kickstarter. I want it to be available, you know, at, at, you know, anywhere. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to keep it going. And I've already started my next project. So I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know if, if we're going to keep doing Kickstarter. It's been great, but I don't know how that, how things are going to kind of flesh out in the next, you know, year because the world is changing so fast in the way we're delivering product now. Oh, I still lo- I love crowdfunding because I think, you know, like I said, you can make a video, you could show the work, you can market your product a lot more effectively than you can by just putting an ad in preview. Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of awkward to, to go out and ask people because you come across like you're, you know, you're you're nagging and you're being a pain in the ass about, you know, oh, hey, will you fund me? But it's just about really honestly to see if anybody has any interest in it because if you do it the other way where you just go out and print it how many do you print you print ten thousand you print twenty thousand and then once you got those what do you do with them you know you now you're going okay what am i going to do with these i got a pallet of books sitting you know in my kitchen that my wife uses to hold the door open and i you know believe you know at least with Kickstarter, you know how many people want it. You know, okay, I got a number to tell the printer. This is how many we make. And, you know, you always print a little more. So you got them, you know, for ones that are damaged or for ones that, you know, you want you know, things you got to make up for people that didn't get there. So, um, you, you know, it's a good way to gauge whether people want it or not, you know, and, and that could be harsh because if they don't want it, you're kind of like, okay, but at least, you know, you're not wasting your time. Of course, I think uh, I think uh, the big question that a lot of folks are going to have is, okay, what's next for you after this? You know, once Tom is out there, you're getting out there to the stores. Do you have like new titles kind of in the works? Yeah, no, I mean, since since I started this and and the response has been, you know, positive. It's been great. I mean, this is kind of what I've been doing all along, but I've been I haven't done any crowdfunding since you know we started COVID. But yeah, I started my next title. I'm, I'm hoping to have it out by the tail end of the summer. And um, yeah, well, I'm, we're, I'm moving forward. I mean, this is, this is kind of, I don't really have a choice. This is what I, this is what I do. I'm an independent publisher. Um, Marvel's not knocking on my door. So I'm going to just keep putting out my own stuff because you've, you know, you've seen my style. It's not, they're not going to let me draw a little lot of, you know, that's just how it goes. And, uh, you know, I'm cool with it. So this is great, you know, doing my own stuff. Cool, cool. It, it could be it could be challenging, you know. Again, because you know you don't always know, you know, uh, uh, what the response is going to be. But you know, at the end of the day, you, you know, you gotta if you, look. Whether you're working for yourself or you're working for somebody else, it's it's a it's a struggle no matter what. So if you're gonna if you're gonna break your ass, you may as well break your ass for yourself. <laughs> I like the sentiment, man. I, I I really do. All right. Well, Sal. As always, man, great to have you on the show. Great to talk about the work and certainly looking forward to checking out Atomica. But in the meantime, where do folks go? They want to learn more about you and check out your work. Yeah, I'm everywhere, man. I mean, I'm 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 like the, the two dollar whore at the naval base. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. 
uh, you know, Sal Abenanti or, or Mercury Comics. I mean, I'm out there banging the drum. You know, I'm like the guy selling that leaf guard. You know, I'm, I'm, I never shut up and I'm out there, you know, jumping up and down as much as I can. All right. Well, Sal, certainly looking forward to talking to you again, talk about the new titles. and uh... I really appreciate it. I really, I, I really appreciate you having me on. Hi, this is singer Kate Eppers, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout. Okay, everyone, that brings this episode to a close. Big thanks to Chris and Sal for joining me. And if you haven't already, definitely check out their work. It's really amazing stuff. In the meantime, you can follow this show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. Get at me at citywidemax at yahoo.com. And of course, check out this podcast wherever you find your shows. As always, keep those ears open.